Hello, hi everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm very happy to present this joint work with Andres Moya and Fabio Sanchez, who are two professors at the University of Los Andes, just like me. And Fabio is here, so there are some very political, uh, contextual questions. He will be the, the best person to address all these aspects. Uh, so, uh, what we do in this paper is to study the Serpilopaga, which is a scholarship that many people, uh, Colombians know at least, uh, that was that would pay during four years for the university of their choice for 10,000 students. These students were selected based on two criteria. They needed to be the sort of below a certain level of income, and they needed to have a really good grade. This was a both sort of merit-based and need-based scholarship. And we will see, the, the question is, did this increase inequality of opportunity? Because now if you're poor and you do well, you're able to go to university. So we, we see this as a real change in opportunity, and I will show you why. Does that translate into an increase in human capital? And we're especially interested in not the exposed effect of the scholarship, meaning those who receive the scholarship tends to be able to go to university, have higher incomes. All this has been demonstrated pretty well. But we know much less about the fact that this opportunity exists when you're a college student. How much does that motivate you to study more and, and, and get better grades? Uh, so there is a first motivation, which is about what are the additional benefits of a scholarship. And as I was saying, we typically think of benefits on the beneficiaries. But when you want to think, is this kind of scholarship worth it or not, you also need to think about this motivational effect. And as we will see, there is a whole lot of students that improve their grades just because they know that now, if they get a good grades, they can go to university. And, and so that's the first motivation for it. And one way of showing this is, Look at this is assuming that you have a very good grade, uh, you're in the top 10% of the distribution based on socioeconomic stratum, which in Colombia sort of is a good proxy for how wealthy you are. Six is the wealthiest and one is the, the least wealthy. Then how likely are you to enter an accredited post-secondary enrollment? Um, meaning an accredited university, meaning a high quality university in Colombia. Uh, you're less than 20% likely, even though you get a super grade, you're less than 20% likely to go to university if you're in, in a socioeconomic stratum one or two, but you're super likely to go, well, almost 60% if you're in the, the very rich. Once the scholarship appeared, this is how it looks like. So it really aligned the bay. Now, if you have a really good grade, you're as likely to go to university if you're poor as if you're rich. So this is a, a, one of the most drastic change in opportunities that we have ever seen. And hence, the question that we ask is, this is already a result from another work from Fabio and, and, and Juliana Londoño and Catherine Rodriguez. So our question is how this change that we see, this change in opportunity, actually changes the motivation and thus the results of the students. And the best um, sort of, the second motivation thus is really why social mobility is so important. Social mobility triggers human capital. It's beyond a debate on just education and is scholarship worth or not, is the effect of, of social mobility on, on human capital accumulation. Uh, so, so on the, I'll skip this slide for, for the, the time constraint. So let's summarize what uh, Ser Pilopaga is. It has 10,000 10, new students per year, and that costs about 2.7, no, that means 2.7% of all students. Uh, it funds entire undergraduate students, typically four years of education. And the downside of it is that it's very costly. The first year it was 4.6% of the budget of the Ministry of Education. And since there is a new cohort every year, that meant 20% by 2019. It has two criteria. One is the need-based eligibility, which means you need to have a CISBEN score, which is a social economic index below a certain level, and basically we estimate that this is mean you need to be in the 55th percent poorest of the country. You don't need to be super poor in that sense, but in relative terms for Colombia, but the, uh, it's the share of the population. And merit-based. And basically you, you have a certain score, and the score is set so that we have about 10,000 students per year that could enter it. And the, the timing here will be very important. 2014 was the first year, but this was decided after the exams. So this would not affect the motivation of the students. But then everyone, it has made a lot of noise in Colombia. Everyone knew that there is this huge education program that promotes the best performing poor students. And hence, in 2000, 
15, it's fully credible and there is a full effect on the motivation of the students. And that's what we're interested in. Uh, okay, now what is our prior in one sentence is that it's the top of the distribution. In Saber 11 is the, the, high, the end of high school test that we have in Colombia. It is the top of the distribution that should be affected. If you're below median students, you know you, you will not get uh, at that level in one year, you cannot make that huge jump, so you won't necessarily change your level of effort, but if you're, a top, if you're already a good student, then you should be the ones that are most motivated. So in a descriptive table, this is a sort of difference in differences that is both sort of, it's useful to give some stats, but it's also useful to get a sort of a difference of indifference of a look at the result. If we look at the average in the difference in difference, basically, uh, this is a rank. Think of a rank of the population. If you're zero, you're the lowest. If you're 100, you're the best student in your cohort. So if you're in the eligible ones are the poor ones, uh, these 55% poorest of the population, the average rank is 45 versus the average rank is about 55.2 for the, the, the non-eligible, meaning the wealthiest ones. So it's a 10.4 difference. This difference, we will call it the socioeconomic uh, achievement gap, 10.4. And this, we can look at it percentile per percentile. This sort of anal analysis by percentile will be central in our analysis, given the hypothesis that the top percentile is the one that should react the most. So this is the initial gap. And we look at how it changes from 2013 and 2004 to the year 2015 with the motivational effect. And there is a drop of about, of, here it's a small drop in the average gap and the biggest drop when we look at the, the differences in ranks from 9.7 difference to 8.8. And this drop, uh, we basically divide it by the initial value to get, this can be interpreted as what is the gap reduction as a share of the achievement gap, of the initial achievement gap. So there is a 4.6 percentage reduction in the achievement gap uh, in the entire population on average. And there is a, this is concentrated in the top percentiles. That's where we see the reduction, especially at the 90th percentile, there is a 9% reduction in the initial gap. Meaning the students, they didn't receive any, this is still somewhat descriptive, that, that's not our best estimation, but the message is they didn't receive more books, they didn't get more buildings, they, the only thing that they got is the hope that if they have good grades, they can go to university. And just this reduced by 9%, the initial gap, the huge gap that there is between a wealthier and poorer students in Colombia. So the initial strategy that we had, in fact, in the previous version of the paper was just to do a regression discontinuity. We make use of the fact that there is this uh, sort of C-band threshold where the, the students that are slightly poor are eligible to the program, those that are slightly richer are not eligible to the program. So this is perfect for doing a regression discontinuity. We had the, 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 the detailed data to be able to do this. Uh, and so in this, you have this effect of being eligible, controlling for the C-band score, uh, and interacted with uh, other variables, etc. The reason why we cannot do this, and we, we got into problem, problem when we sent it for publication, was that there are a number of other programs that use the same, these are the threshold, the threshold is different if you're in the 14 cities or urban or rural, but we normalize to take this into account. The reason why we could not do a simple regression discontinuity is that many programs share the same threshold. Some of these are um, early childhood programs, a housing program, even credit for students, etc. So the main argument, counter argument that we had is if you want your regression discontinuity, the logic of a regression discontinuity is I want to compare students just below and just above, above and below the, the eligibility threshold. It doesn't work anymore because now we have a, a difference that could be driven by the other programs that are also triggered by the same eligibility. So what did we do? You do a difference in discontinuities. This is based on the fact that most of these, all these programs were pre-existing, hence any, now what we will do is take, think of it as we do regression discontinuity in 2015, and we do a regression discontinuity in the years before 2015. And we take the difference between the two regression discontinuities. And that is the change that happens as the threshold, so that could be attributed to the program. And that is the regression, we have this eligible effect, but we're also taking out times 2015. Uh, now, these are the results from the regression discontinuity, and basically now we see even stronger results than when we use the difference in differences. 
And what we find is there is a, an effect that is really starting at the 75th percentile and above and the 90th percentile. At the 90th percentile, meaning the pretty good students in the distribution, we find a 1.7, 1.57 change in the ranking, and that represents 16 percent of the initial gap that there was between the rich and the poor. Now, I'm saying without giving them anything else but the the opportunity to to do better if they enter um, to get to university if they have better results, they increase their results by 16 percent. So that's probably the key result of the paper. But we have other, uh, so if we look at it percentile, now we do this quantile RD, diff in RD at every level, we find that there is not much happening in the bottom of the distribution as we hypothesized at the beginning. But if we look at the top of the distribution, there is a, a significant and positive effect uh, that is happening for these, for these good students at the top of the distribution. The typical discontinuity graph tells us that uh, again, we just a quick look tells us that there is not much happening in the bottom of the distribution, but by the 75th percentile, we do find something. And when we look at the 90th percentile, then we see even uh, more substantial and clear differences between the two groups. Now, we want to say, so I won't have time to re-summarize what I said, but now we have additional results. One is looking at now Saber 9 results. So now instead of being on 11th grade students, we will look at 9th grade students. The data is less detailed. We don't have, we cannot do regression discontinuity there. We have to do just a difference in difference by school based on how many eligible students. The result to summarize this result is here, we find that once the Serpilopaga program starts, the schools that have a higher proportion of eligible students and start having better results compared to the schools that have a, a, in change in, uh, compared to the schools that have less uh, eligible students. And that means there is an improvement that happens among schools that have higher eligible students, and that is also likely to be attributed to the, the motivation effect. Of course, it's not as well identified as the regression discontinuity. The other, the last question that we try to answer with the data is, how much is this now affecting the enrollment rate of the students? So we, we know something already is that the, the top 5% of the students here, so now we have a uh, curve that's comparing eligible to non-eligible students and 2014 to 2015. What the data tells us is that if you look at 2000, the eligible students since 2014, they have a clear jump. And this is a bit like the first graph that I was showing you. There is a very high level of admission for these students. And this is because they're receiving the money. OK, that's what we would expect in 2014. They're receiving the money they, they enter. But this chunk of students that improved their grades substantially between those that were just between the 70th and 90th percentile among the eligible ones, they improved their grades. We know this. And now with this graph, we know that they also substantially improved their likelihood to enter uh, university. Hence, the fact that they improved their grades, even though these are sort of the disappointed ones, they worked. they worked hard, but at the end they didn't get the scholarship. And despite the fact that they didn't get the scholarship, the fact that they worked harder and they got a better grade, which is also a criteria for entry at university, uh, they were more likely to enter university by uh, some around five percentage points for most of this group. And so that, that, that is another key result, and that tells us that there is a substantial increase in human capital that results just from the motivation. This is not the, the, the money effect. This is the effect of having worked harder because of the possibility of receiving the money. So imagine how a society that has better equality of opportunity could actually change this level of, uh, of motivation. Uh, just, uh, we all work not only for publishing papers, but trying to influence uh, some of the policy makers. So I uh, thought there was a useful quote from uh, President Santos when he was president, where at some point he, when he was defending Serpilo Paga, he said, the program affected the quality of education through a number of things, and then the motivation of the youth to put more effort so that they can access better universities, a question that was reflected in the recent results in the Saber exams. So we were pretty happy to see that the, it reached all the, so with Fabio, we made the, the, we shared the results and the lessons, and it, when, when the debate was made, was around should we continue Serpilo Paga or not, and we know that it did not continue as it is, it became Generation E and lost a lot of its uh, magnitude and, and impact with it, but uh, there was, a, it, it did have some weight on, on some of the decisions. 
To conclude, in the bigger pictures, what we see is first that simply the motivation generated by, by Serpilopaga increased grades in the top of the distribution by 0.09 standard deviations, and that represents 16% of the initial socioeconomic gap. The students' engagement uh, is really driven as a key input, and this key input depends on how much opportunities do they have. Uh, and, but this effect is concentrated at the top of the distribution, so we should not think that it's a substitute for better quality, better teachers, and all the other. I mean, it's something that may be a complement, but it's, it's not working for everyone, so, so obviously it cannot be a substitute. So in this debate, but is it worth it? We just say there is another argument that needs to be taken into account when we think, should we have this kind of scholarship or not? Uh, thank you, because time's over. I should, I should.